So when talking about building an asterisk cluster, what exactly is it that we're trying to do? So I'm gonna provide an overview of clustering. Why do we care? Why do we want it? How do we do it? And I'm also gonna talk about how to utilize asterisk as the, customer, uh, as the cluster's SIP proxy or registration proxy where all the phones register to. And what I mean by this is how we can cluster and hide all the asterisk machines behind this registration proxy and keep them internal. And when I say uh, a cluster of feature servers, when I say feature server, I mean a machine that actually does stuff like voicemail, uh, queues, uh, hunt groups, stuff like that, as opposed to a registration proxy, which is the fronting machine that all the phones and UAs register to. So after going some details over uh, why and how we do this, I've also prepared a small demo, which is just a little proof of concept cluster. Um, and I'll also provide to anybody who wants, you can email me at kmarks at lcs.com and I'll send you all the asterisk configs, all the files, all the materials, so you can kind of look at that. So you can keep those, play with those, uh, change them, do whatever you want really. So hopefully some interest has been sparked by then and uh, after the demo, we can kind of have a discussion about a purely asterisk cluster. Firstly, why cluster? You know, why do I really care? Um, I've heard people say, you know, I have my dedicated PBXs and I provision these and I send these out to the customers and they're single tenant and everything pretty much works fine. And perhaps that does provide everything that you do need right now. But as your customer base expands and you grow, you'll need to have, you'll need to consider maybe a multi-tenant design. And this is a bigger, more monolithic system where all your customers share the same resources and you host this on your side. So that's probably something you're, you're going to want to think about. Scaling. So when you have a single tenant dedicated PBX, really what scaling effectively amounts to is throwing resources at the machine. More memory, faster memory, more processors, uh, more storage, faster storage. But that's pretty much all you can do with a single tenant dedicated PBX. And that kind of starts to break down pretty quickly. But if you have a cluster of asterisk machines as you grow and grow, you can simply add capacity to the cluster by putting more feature servers in it, putting more asterisk media machines in the cluster. Another aspect of clustering is the simplification of maintenance and registration. So if you have a cluster and you need to do maintenance or work on some node, you can simply take that node out of the cluster, do work on it, do whatever upgrades you have to do, and it's easier and not disruptive at all because the rest of your cluster is still up. There's no downtime with your product to your customers. Also, having a cluster fronted with a registration proxy means that you have a single place for all the UAs to register to. So that can also simplify maintenance if you're troubleshooting SIP registration and stuff like that. You know, as opposed to having uh, 10 dedicated uh, asterisk machines for 10 different customers with 10 different places that phones are registering to. So all these things can kind of add up to a more robust setup. Uh, I've, I've talked to more than a couple people who do provision uh, single account dedicated PBXs and these get deployed directly to the customer's office or work site or wherever. And there's uh, a few limitations to, to doing things this way. Uh, firstly, you have to maintain uh, a dial plan and other configs for each appliance or device that you ship out. So if you have to make a change to your dial plan later, you have to do this for all your dial plans that have been deployed with all of your devices to all of your different customers. Hardware also has to be potentially maintained on a customer by customer basis. If you have dedicated PBXs that you're shipping out to customers 
and some hardware upgrade has to happen or something breaks, do you mail them a whole new device? Do you send them the part they need to fix it? Do you send somebody to their site to fix it? So this can kind of complicate things versus having a uh, multi-tenant clustered setup that you maintain in your office, in your data center. Also, depending on how the dedicated PBX was deployed to the customer and how it lives in their network, you as the ITSP might start to you know, become liable for other things in their network. If there's other uh, traffic that's going through your device or there's other stuff that's connected to it, you'll kind of have to start to own that a little bit from a maintenance standpoint is, is a risk that you run. So a multi-tenant alternative does solve a lot of these problems and also means that you have one system to troubleshoot. So it's infrastructure that's on your end that you host yourself. You know, you have one dial plan, one set of configs, and that can simplify a lot of processes. And so, and so that clustered multi-tenant setup then can permit more maintainable growth. So when we're talking about growth, what we're really talking about is adding capacity quickly. And in the context of this talk, what that means is adding another node to the cluster, adding another asterisk feature server. And so how do we do this? And, and this is a really simple process. You provision a new cluster node, which if you've done anything with asterisk, you've probably got some procedure or scripting or maybe some chef recipe. Maybe you're virtualized and you can just clone another machine in the cluster, change some network adapter settings. But at any rate, it's pretty simple to get a new asterisk machine up and running. And once you have your shiny new asterisk feature server, you can simply add it to the registration proxies SIP config. And once you have it referenced in there, it's just a matter of reloading the SIP module. And the registration proxy that's fronting everything is now aware of and capable of routing calls to this new node. And that's really all there is to it. It's a pretty straightforward process. But what else does this type of setup offer me? So you can also uh, simplify maintenance with a clustered multi-tenant setup. So this is kind of in the same vein as scalability because we're talking about putting nodes into the cluster, taking other nodes out. The difference being obviously that we're modifying the makeup of the cluster, not to add capacity, but to do some kind of maintenance. So common maintenance can take on a number of forms. Um, hardware for a given node might have to be modified or updated. You know, disk drives, memory, you name it. Uh, this kind of maintenance is very common, and if you're working on the hardware, you're clearly going to have to halt the machine to work on it. Software updates uh, might need to be applied to patch things and keep stuff secure. You know, if you have to reboot your machine and you're otherwise doing software updates and stuff like that, you can't really keep it in the cluster. So that's another case in which to do maintenance, you're going to have to take a node down. And you also might want to switch versions of Aster. So maybe you have 1.8 and you want to convert all your cluster nodes to 11. These are, uh, you know, the common thing here with all these different types of maintenance is that you need to remove the node from the cluster, do some kind of work on it, and then put it back in. So in the case of a big software update, like going from asterisk 1.8 to 11, you can not only safely roll out the update without downtime, because when you're working on one node, all the other cluster nodes are still available, but you can do it slowly and gradually over time. So let's say you have 10 1.8 machines. You can swap in, uh, you can take one out, uh, use your procedure to convert that to an asterisk 11 machine, and then put that back in then you can just kind of monitor it, make sure your procedure was good and that that node is working as you expect it to. And if you do encounter any problems, you can just kind of fix your procedure for converting 1.8 to 11 and uh, then apply it to other nodes. 
So you can gain a lot of confidence in doing your updates this way by taking your time and having one node that's 11, and then two, and then three. And then once, once you're very confident that things are going to work as you expect, you can just go on ahead and convert over the rest of the nodes. And, and your product won't have any downtime during this process either. You know, as compared to like a dedicated PBX single tenant where if you do anything to it that's involving switching from Asterisk 1.8 to 11, you know, the whole product essentially has to go down. Yeah, that's a good question. So he's asking if, you know, how do you account for differences in syntax you might have between a 1.8 dial plan and an 11 dial plan? Um, in that specific example, you would have to have a dial plan that's compatible with both. Uh, we, we, for example, have a dial plan that works with both 1.8 and 11. So, but you're absolutely right. If, if you were leveraging the newer syntax and other modules and stuff like that, that would be another consideration for sure, definitely. And also, when you're, when you're taking a node out, you can use stuff like core stop graceful, which is going to tell that node uh, to A, not take any new calls, and B, when the active call count gets to zero, to shut down. So not only are the other nodes in the cluster still taking calls and serving up features, but the node that you're actually working on will not interrupt any calls at all. So in, in using stuff like core stop graceful, you can make uh, taking a node out absolutely invisible to a customer. So in addition to simplified maintenance, there's some uh, considerations regarding SIP registration and the provisioning of your UAs, your phones, uh, that can be simplified using the cluster approach. So instead of having phones on different accounts registering to different places, they all register back to the same place, your registration proxy. So from a provisioning standpoint, this implies that, and you know, however it is that you're doing your provisioning of your phones, that you can specify a single host for all your customers' phones across all the accounts to register to. Uh, you can also use the CLI uh, SIP commands to uh, send notifies, for example, to UAs. So you can uh, maybe have a situation where you have user configurable settings on phones and these cause the provisioning files to be modified. You know, you can have some event or something that fires and whenever a phone's uh, provisioning configs change, you can have some automated piece that goes through and uses the uh, things like SIP notify to tell the phones to reprovision if they're capable of doing that. So this is just another example of how things can be pretty nice and easy to do with the asterisk CLI. There's also times when you might just want to kick a phone off completely if you see something suspicious. Uh, you know, you maybe think that toll fraud might be going on or something like that. You can use stuff like SIP unregistered to immediately get that phone off. And then you can maybe change its SIP credentials when you have time so that it can't re-register. So, so all these things can kind of contribute to uh, a more robust product. Uh, you can minimize downtime by splitting the work up between the different nodes in the cluster. Uh, you can also increase reliability by having dedicated feature uh, nodes. You might have one part of the cluster that just does fax or another part that just does voicemail. So things can fail independently and not propagate problems to other places. Individual nodes can go down for maintenance or if something just crashed on the machine and you still won't have downtime with your product. Also on point two, I had a, a situation in the past where there was T38 codec negotiation failures when faxes were happening. And this would be the last thing you would see in the log before asterisk segfaulted and crashed. And so an occasional problem with a fax turned into something that segfaulted asterisk and everybody who had active calls on that node, whether they were using fax or not, they could have been doing voicemail or whatever, all those channels got blown away because asterisk crashed. So by factoring fax out into its own node, uh, you can effectively make stuff more reliable. And so I just wanted to take a second again to reiterate the, uh, these advantages of having a multi-tenant uh, clustered setup. 
So clustering is great, but why asterisk? Why not some other tool? Why not Camellio or OpenSips or something like that? And the main reason is that you already know asterisk very well. So you already know the syntax, you already know how to write dial plan, you already know how to troubleshoot stuff, you already know all the commands you can run in the CLI, so there's no learning curve, for example, with how to write the config routing for OpenSips or something like that. You already know how to do everything. And since you can write dial plan, you can build logic for the registration proxy to route stuff in certain ways to the cluster, load balancing, for example. <coughs> So the main thing is that you already know asterisk and you're leveraging that. So the demo has uh, three servers, three hosts. There's regproxy.asterisk, which is obviously the registration proxy, and that's where the phones are going to be registering to. Um, and behind this are the two feature servers, the cluster nodes, node1.asterisk and node2.asterisk. Um, and in this demo, we'll have three phones under two different customers. So phone one and two are customer one, and phone three is customer two. And I call things like cus.voip a vanity domain because I might have my main VoIP domain and it's, let's just call it VoIP. And then for the subdomain, you can set the customer name so that when you're processing and tokenizing stuff like the SIP domain channel variable, you can kind of pull that cust one out, cust two out and kind of use that to make decisions. What customer is this? So how do I want to treat them? I'll also briefly explain what the, the configs on these machines look like. So the cluster nodes, SIP config, there's some general settings. And then the only SIP peer it should ever really care about is the registration proxy. It doesn't have to know about any of the, any of the other nodes in the cluster because it, it, it just shouldn't care about that. So we'll specify the registration proxy, uh, that it's a peer, what its address, uh, address is, and what context is the entry point into the dial plan. So in this case, that's from dash reg proxy. Now, the actual registration proxy, uh, there's some general settings, and then we wanna specify the actual cluster nodes, node 1.0 and node 2.0. So we have a template here, because most of the settings for the cluster node should be the same. The cluster node should look very, very similar to each other. And ideally, the only thing that would differ between them would be, you know, the host IP address. So basically node one and node two inherit this template and then just specify what their addresses are. And then for the actual phones that are going to be registering, there's also a phone template, which has some uh, basic settings uh, context is important, that's its entry point into the dial plan, so that'll be the from local context. And then we just specify phone one, two, and three, and what their password is. So the dial plans are also pretty straightforward. Um, the cluster dial plans, all they really have is a no-op and a wait inside of them, and the reason is because for the purposes of the demo, we just wanna see stuff get routed to a cluster node. We don't actually have to go to the PSTN or do voicemail or anything. We just want to see the CLI light up so that we know that that call is going there. So the registration proxy also has a pretty simple dial plan. Um, we're specifying the proxy mode, which is what kind of scenario uh, we're doing. Is it load balancing? Is it some other scenario? And based upon what that is, we'll conditionally go to one of these proxy mode contexts which just implements some kind of cluster routing logic. So there's three that we'll go over. And the way those work is they will set the node value, the target node that we want to send to the cluster, node one or node two. And then they'll call the cluster route context, which just does the dial and sends the call to that node. So there's three different uh, kind of pieces of routing logic we're gonna look at. Um, one is load balancing, which is pretty Pretty obvious, pretty straightforward. Um, the second one is to force all the calls and extensions for a single account to the same server. And the reason we might want to do this is 
There's certain features like queues or extension to extension dialing where we just want to keep you know, all of customer one's calls on a single node in the cluster. So that's the second scenario we'll look at. Um, the last one is to put calls for a given account on a dedicated node. So we might have customer one, customer two, and customer three. And customer one and two generate massive amounts of traffic. And we just want to say, customer one, you go to node two. Customer two, you go to node one, just to guarantee that they never stack up on the same machine and way too much traffic goes to that one node. So uh, for the load balancing logic, uh, this is the proxy mode zero. So the proxy mode zero context, basically for every node in the cluster, we're going to the get node load context, which shells out to get load, which uses, just uses SSH to execute a script on each uh, cluster node. And all that does is use asterisk RX to do core show channels and then just look at how many active calls are on it. So for each uh, node, we'll calculate how many active calls they have, and then we'll set the target node to be the one that has the fewest calls. And then we'll go to cluster route to actually place that dial to send it off to that node. So. So this is already set to, so this is already set to uh, proxy mode zero. And this is the CLI for node one, and this is the CLI for node two. So, so phone one, which is customer one, is going to place a call. And when there's no load on any of the nodes, we default to node one. So you can see that call show up in node one. And basically you can see that the, the nodes on the load is zero in both cases. And so our logic says, oh, well, they're all the same. Let's just go to node one. Now if we place another call, let's use phone two. You can see this one go to node two. And this remote Unix connection, remote Unix connection disconnected, that's just the asterisk RX running and saying core show channels and then parsing the output of it. And so you can see in here, you know, for node one, we calculate the load. For node two, you calculate the load. So that's actually node two right there. This is node one. There's one call on it. It has a load of one. And then node two, which there were no calls on, oops, uh, has a load of zero. So obviously node two has fewer calls. So we set the target node to node two, and then we get a cluster route to send that call to node two, as you saw it show up in here. And if we, if we place a third call, again, the, the load on both of those machines will be the same and therefore it should go to node one. And so there you can see the call show up on node one. And once again, you can see in here, uh, you know, the load on node one is one, the load on node two is one, and we've calculated those by parsing the output of core show channels on each node, and they're both the same, so we default to node one. So that's kind of an example of just really basic load balancing uh, that you can do an asterisk and write it with dial plane that's extremely easy to understand and write and build. So proxy mode one is sending all the calls from one customer to the same server. So send all of customer one's calls to you know, the first server that we find a customer one call on. And so the logic for this is also pretty straightforward. Um, we tokenize the SIP domain to pull out customer one or customer two to see which customer we're dealing with. And then we go to get account active uh, node. 
And in here, we just show out to a script that looks inside a file, which effectively kind of acts like a database table. <coughs> and uh, you know, the add active call script on the bottom right and delete active call, those are used to add records to this active call table. And uh, so once we go to get active, get account active node, we can just find out, oh, okay, customer one is on node two, let's send off customer one's calls to that node. And so the get active node script also is just doing some basic parsing of that file to, uh, to kind of pull some tokens out of these, uh, these strings and say, oh, okay, it's on node one. So that's another one we'll take a look at real quick right here. Also, as I mentioned before, phones one and two are customer one, and phone three is customer two. So I'm gonna change the proxy mode to proxy mode one here. And I'm going to reload the dial plan as well. And also the file that these uh, active call records get stored into is called nodes active. So I'll kind of dump the output of that file so you guys can see it as calls are being made. So right now no calls have been made. So So there's nothing in that file. So if I use phone one to place a call, let's go back up to the top of this. So I parse stuff out of the uh, SIP domain and I see that this is customer one and then I go to get account active node, and all I'm doing in there is shelling out to that script that basically just looks at the contents of that file. And there was nothing in there when this call was made, so this record was made after it was decided to route to node one. Um, and if you notice from, uh, from that script, if there's no active calls anywhere, we by default route to node one. So now that we actually have an active call record in there, if I place another call, from customer one, it will parse this file, it will pull out node one and say, okay, that's our target node, that's where we wanna send stuff to. So I'll put some space in here so we can kind of see things better. So phone two places a call now. You can see phone two is also going to node one. And if you kind of look through this, uh, this dial plan output to the CLI, inside proxy mode one, we're parsing cust one out of SIP domain. Then we're going to get account active node and we're looking in that file and we're seeing this first call right here. We're seeing the call record for that and we see that it's on node one. Then we set that as the target node and then we go to cluster route which just does the dial that actually sends the call off. And so if you look at uh, this file again, you can see both those active call records. And as we hang stuff up, you can see delete active call getting called and those active call records start to go away. This is the main hang up handler. And so the last example is pretty straightforward too. Basically, like I said, we want sometimes if we have two big customers, we want dedicated cluster nodes for them so that they don't end up on the same machine. So all this dial plan is going to do is go to the proxy mode two context, then it's going to parse the file nodes dedicated and just see, you know, oh, cust one is supposed to go to node two. And then it's gonna set that as the target node and then place the call. Use the dial to send the call to, the, to that cluster node. So again, there's a script get dedicated node 
that just parses that file and maps an account to which node it should go to. So I'm going to update the dial plan. And if we look at that file, you can see that customer one is supposed to go to node two and customer two and three are supposed to go to node one. So if we place a call from phone one or two, this file is going to get parsed and it's gonna send them to node two. So we place this call. This is the node two host and we can see it show up at node two. Phone two is also customer one, so this should also get routed to node two. And as you can see, that shows up in node two as well. Uh, phone three is customer two, and customer two should get routed to node one. So if we place a call there, you can see customer two's phone call getting sent to cluster node one. And so those are, the, uh, those are the main little pieces of routing logic I, I wanted to demo. This is obviously a little proof of concept. So there's uh, you know, a lot that's been assumed or ignored, but uh, I think for demonstrating the purposes of how you can generate logic inside of a registration proxy to send stuff to uh, a cluster of asterisk machines has been demonstrated. So if anybody has any questions or, and also, uh, my email address is kmarks at lcs.com, and if you email me, I'll send you all these configs and scripts and everything if you want. So, but yeah, any questions or? Email It's uh, kmarks at lcs.com, kmarks at lcs.com. Any questions? So this is great for inbound uh, clustering. What if, say, I'm on the same SIP registration as the service provider and I want to call one of my customers, but I don't want it based on my logic to go out to my carrier to hairpin to come back in. Uh, do you have any uh, good scripts to shunt that over to where my, where my customers are? Um, I don't have anything that does that logic specifically, but that's probably something that would not be hard at all to make. I mean, that, that sounds like that could be potentially a pretty uh, concise piece of dial plan, but I don't have that per se, so. Hey, we have one up here. Yep. Hi, uh, do you have any experience managing uh, queues, inbound queues with these uh, model? So I actually have a cluster of asterisk machines that's being fronted with open, open SIPs right now. So this is kind of a proof of concept I was starting to judge its viability to actually go into production. But as, as now, I do not have it set up in production. This is just a little proof of concept, so. Any other questions? Okay, <clears throat> thanks very much, Kyle. Thank you.